Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Leah Fishbein with Becker's Healthcare. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. We are pleased to have Scott Becker, publisher of Becker's Healthcare, here to moderate today's question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we'll be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you use to register. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar and introduce our presenters. Lisa Rock has served as President of National Medical Billing Services since 2003 and has over 30 years of experience in the industry. Lisa manages more than 500 at fillers specializing in revenue cycle management for ambulatory surgery centers and their affiliated surgeons. Lisa is listed in the St. Louis Business Journal as the most influential businesswoman in St. Louis in 2016 and named as one of the small businesses' monthly top women business owners. National Medical has been voted one of the best places to work by Becker's AAC Review, Modern Healthcare, and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. The company was also named to Global Outsourcing 100 list by the International Association of Outsourcing Professional, which was featured in Fortune Magazine. Tamara Wagner is considered one of the strongest coders in the AFC industry. She joined National Medical Billing Services in 2004 and today serves as the Vice President of Coding Compliance. In this position, Tamara is responsible for creating and conducting a systematic audit process for National Medical's clients and coders. She then identifies areas of opportunity for improvement and organizes the training of any such coding and compliance issues. In addition, Tamara makes sure that she has that she and her team focus on get, getting extensive continuing education and ASC coding so that all national medical coders stay current with all trends and changes in the industry. Tamara began her career at Smith Klein Clinical Laboratories as a medical technologist. She then moved into various healthcare roles before joining National Medical. She is a frequent speaker at industry conferences, including ASCA, Becker's ASC, and also regularly contributes to numerous industry publications. Allison Cooley is certified professional coder and has been with National Medical for five years. She is widely considered the premier coding thought leader for spine and has deep expertise in orthopedics and pain management. Allison is regularly asked to speak around the nation at spine conferences, including ASCA, Becker's Game and Spine, Ohio ASC Society, the International Society for Advancement of Spine Surgery, the New York, New Jersey ASC Society, and the AAPC conferences. Allison has also regularly published for articles in publications such as Becker's and Well Decision Health. Lisa, I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Leah, very much, and thank you for the opportunity to share our experiences regarding spine and pain coding uh, with the audience. I'd like to introduce first Allison Cooley, who will get us started on the top spine procedures currently performed in an ASC, so we're gonna start on slide five. Allison? Hi, Lisa, thank you very much. I would be happy to. So today we're gonna to talk about um, the top six procedures that we're seeing currently uh, performed in an ASC setting for spine and pain. There are four of the top spine procedures, lumbar decompression, lumbar discectomy, um, anterior cervical discectomy infusion, and lumbar posterior inner body fusion. Next slide, please. And for the pain procedures, we're gonna discuss spinal cord stimulators, um, permanent and temporary, and radio frequency ablation. In order to code these procedures, coders should have a really strong uh, anatomy knowledge of the spine so that they can not only know where the doctor is performing these procedures, but know the code sets involved because the, the code sets for spine are separated into the areas of the spine, the sacrum, the lumbar, the thoracic, the cervical. They're also separated into approaches. So you need to know the area the physician is working in in order to determine his approach, the level assignment, and the correct CPT and diagnosis assignments for those particular procedures. Understanding a spinal segment is important um, for arthrodesis, uh, which is spinal fusion. 
the segment would be two vertebral bodies separated by an intervertebral disc because when you're fusing the spine, you're fusing one vertebral body to another. So that's your segment. You have this, the vertebral body above, the vertebral body below, and the intervertebral disc in the middle, which is normally uh, gone in an inner body fusion. Um, and they're fusing those two levels together. So that's one whole segment. When you're talking about decompression, a segment is one vertebral body because what you're doing is you're removing bone in order to open up the foramenal space to make sure that the nerves have room to move around and to take the compression off of the nerves. So you would be removing bone from, let's say, L4 and possibly bone from L5 in order to decompress a nerve root. So, so decompression is um, considered one vertebral body for a segment. For spinal coding, you really need to know the approach. You need to know if the patient, if the physician is going in anterior through the front, posterior through the back, lateral through the side, or presacral, which is just above the sacrum. Um, I don't see a lot of presacral. I do see a lot of anterior, posterior. And really, the only time I see lateral is when one physician is, is doing an anterior, posterior um, inner body fusion on a patient. Um, all of the codes are separated by these approaches. So you need to be sure that you understand exactly what approach the physician is taking. The, the, the way the procedure is performed will also help you choose the appropriate codes. Was the incision open? Was it minimally invasive? Was it percutaneous? Was it endoscopic? Um, last year we gained an endoscopic code for, uh, uh, for lumbar disc decompression. Um, percutaneous, we've had for a few years, and as far as minimally invasive, most of the, the spine codes are co covered under open, I'm sorry, covered under open, even if they're minimally invasive, um, because they can still directly view the, the spine anatomy while they're working through a smaller incision, which is what they mean by minimally invasive. We can go to the next slide. Again, approach is very important as we discussed because these codes are separated by the type of approach um, they're using. For example, a lumbar inner body fusion, if they're doing it anterior, the CPT code is 22558. If they're doing it posterior and it's just inner body, it would be 22630. But if it's inner body combined with a posterior lateral fusion, it would be 22633. Instrumentation in spinal coding is also separated by anterior and posterior um, types of hardware. So if you're putting an anterior instrumentation, uh, such as a plate and screws, you would use 22845. If it's going in the posterior part of the spine, non-segmental, which would be one, uh, one level of the spine, two points of attachment, would be 22840. Segmental would be three or more points of attachment in the posterior spine, that would be 22842. There are other um, codes, 22843, going up from there, depending on how many levels you're actually doing. The most common are 22840 and 22842. As far as documentation challenges, um, it's very important that the physician accurately document exactly what he's doing in the operative note. For example, this is probably one of the most challenging, would be decompression. When you're coding for a lumbar decompression for stenosis, um, the code 63047 would be one level and 63048 would be each additional level. Well, at one level, you could potentially be decompressing two nerves, the exiting and the traversing nerve root, which would be two levels. However, if the physician only says, I did a lumbar decompression at L45, but doesn't specify that he decompressed both nerve roots, you can only give him 63047. But if he says that he did the exiting and the traversing nerve roots were both decompressed at that one level, you can give him 63047 and 63048. So if he doesn't document exactly which nerve roots that he is doing his decompression on or which nerve roots were decompressed during that case, he could be losing potential claim payment because he could be 
losing potential CPT codes to be able to bill. So um, that's something that if it's unclear to you in the report, or if he just says nerves, you definitely want to clarify with your physician and make sure you understand what he's talking about. Or, hey, Allison, this is Lee, or, or she. <laughs> he or she, yes. I apologize. <laughs> he or she. No, 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 He or she. <laughs> okay. These are just um, some images. I I'm big on pictures. I love pictures. So these are just some images of what it looks like when they perform a spinal laminectomy. Um, normally, they'll do a full laminectomy if they're decompressing uh, a nerve root. They'll only do a partial laminectomy if they're going in for a um, disc herniation. So as you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, they've done a complete laminectomy here. They've completely removed the bone in between the two spinous process in order to be able to make an opening for the nerve root to have more room to move around. Um, if they were uh, doing a discectomy, they might remove a small part of that or make a hole in the lamina in order to be able to get to the disc herniation in order to get it out of there to decompress the nerves that it's pressing on. And this just shows you the back of the spine. Um, if you run your hand down the back of your spine, you have all these little knobs. That's what you're looking at in this picture. Those are the spinous process. And what they do when they do a complete laminectomy and they remove the spinous process is where it says dura, they've opened up an entire hole to the dura in order to decompress. Um, so they're, they're making an opening so that it has more room to be able to, to move around because sometimes you'll get a bony overgrowth in there and it will cause a compression on the dura or the nerves and they'll need to open it up in order to free them up so that, so that you can stop having leg pain or, or back pain or whatever it is that, that it's compressing and causing pain on. So the first procedure I'd like to talk about would be the lumbar decompression. And, and as I said before, it, it's good to know whether they are decompressing just say the lateral recess or the central canal, or they're decompressing specifically around certain nerve roots. This particular opera core is really good um, documentation for a three level lumbar decompression. He's decompressing L3 and L4, uh, I'm sorry, L3, 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 4 and L4, 5, but between those two levels, he's actually decompressing three nerve roots, the exiting and traversing at each level. So he goes on to make his approach. Uh, the patient has lateral recess stenosis and foraminal stenosis and hypertrophy. So he goes in and he makes his approach, and then he uses a Metrex tube dilator, which is a small uh, retractor that they can expand in order to get to the space. It's sort of a minimally invasive approach where they can still see the anatomy. Um, he removes the soft tissue. Uh, he uses a drill to perform lam laminectomies at all three of the vertebral bodies. He removes the ligamentum flavum. And then he uses a kerosene to perform I'm sorry, he uses a kerosene in order to perform central bilateral recess decompression. But here is where he makes his, his note really, really well. He specifically decompresses the L3 nerve root bilaterally, the L4 nerve root bilaterally, and the L5 nerve root bilaterally. So instead of only getting two levels of decompression here, he's just given himself three levels, 63047, 63048, and another 63048. And depending on who your carrier is on the second 63048, you would need either a 76 or a 59 modifier in order to show that it was at an additional level. I, Allison, I was gonna say or she, but I actually um, recognize this and I, and I know it's a, it's a, it's a male surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately mm -hmm. most of my spine surgeons are males, so that's why I keep okay. saying he. I apologize for any females out there. Okay, no, we can move not, to the next. It's not unfortunate, it's not unfortunate, it's all good. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this uh, diagram essentially is showing what a normal disc looks like. It's sort of that round, spongy thing in between two vertebral bodies. When I do this talk in person, I usually use Oreo cookies to prove my point 
we make a little Oreo cookie stack to show the spine. Um, the picture on the right is when the disc material actually herni herniates through the annulus and compresses the nerve root. So in a case like this, they would have to go in and they would cut through the lamina just above where it says compressed nerve root. They would cut a small hole in there and they would go in and they would scrape out that disc material that's extruded through the ring around the outside in order to decompress that nerve that it's pressing on. We can go to the next slide. So this is a this is a lumbar discectomy op report versus the the decompression op report because what they're going after here is is a, a disc herniation that is compressing the nerve root rather than just say a bony overgrowth or or ligamentum hypertrophy or something like that they're going after a disc herniation which is can be sometimes more of an acute issue where a patient's had an injury so what they do is They'll go in and they'll go in very similar to a decompression. They'll make a laminotomy, they'll remove part of the facet joint, um, and they will go in and they remove just enough bone in order to be able to get to the disc herniation to remove exactly what um, they need to. Sometimes it's one piece of a disc herniation, sometimes it's multiple pieces herniated outside the annulus. Um, you can go to the next slide, that's where the procedure is. Thank you. Um, so in this particular note, they're decompressing um, and they, I mean, um, they're dissecting down. Uh, they open up the patient, they remove the extraneous material from the interlaminar space. So now where the decompression works on one bone, bony body and then another bony body here, they're working on an inner space. So for the discectomy code 63030, you're working on the inner space because it's the disc in between that's the problem. So they remove all of the extraneous material that they need to remove. The nerve roots are protected. Um, at this time, using pituitary rongers, two large extruded disc fragments are removed from the disc space with the compression of the L3 and L4 nerve roots. So they do the discectomy, which is removing those large extruded disc fragments, which will um, help to decompress those nerves, and then they do a foramenotomy around the nerves in order to clean out any additional um, compression that may be on them. So this particular patient could have had, you know, ridiculous symptoms with pain radiating down their leg or into their foot, and uh, essentially cleaning up the nerve roots and taking those disc herniations off of the nerve roots should alleviate that pain. So in this particular case, um, they did the discectomy on the right side, which is where the, the extrusion was. So this would be coded as 63030 right. Had this been a bilateral disc um, extrusion and they had to go in and remove lamina and facet joints from both sides, you could have coded this as a bilateral procedure. So what what we have difficulty with sometimes is the discectomy versus decompression issue, um, and this is this is across the, the whole country. Um, a lot of times the patient will have both stenosis and a disc herniation. Usually, when that happens, it's the disc herniation that's causing the compression. According to CPT, you code for the diagnosis. So if it is the disc herniation that's causing the issue and compressing the nerve and the physician goes in, he does the laminotomy, he does the facetectomy, he removes the disc herniation, he does the frame anatomy, you're coding 63030 for discectomy. However, if the stenosis is the problem, say it's a lateral recess stenosis caused by a facet hypertrophy or um, an arthropathy, um, something other than the disc herniation, normally you can code that as a decompression because they go in and they'll have to remove more bone, additional bone in order to decompress specifically around those nerve roots. At that point, the disc herniation becomes almost incidental. So you really wanna look for what the, the diagnosis, the presenting diagnosis is for these patients because that usually determines how much bone has to be removed, how much they have to to clean out around the foramen um, 
60047 is a little bit more involved because they're definitely working more around the nerve roots than just, just taking out an extruded disc. And with 60047, sometimes they do have to remove a little bit of the disc in order to completely decompress. That would just be part of doing the decompression. Um, sometimes the documentation here can be confusing or challenging because it almost sounds as though the physician is describing both procedures in one note. And both of these codes, 63030 and 63047, contain very similar elements, laminectomy, laminotomy, um, foramenotomy, facetectomy. They're both included in both of these procedures. So as I said, what you want to look for is you want to look for what the presenting problem is, what the physician is really going after. Is he going after a stenosis diagnosis, such as lateral recess stenosis, or is it a disc herniation compressing the nerve? If you have a question as to what the direction of this surgery is, there's nobody better to ask than the physician who did the procedure. So in which case you should query just to make sure that you're clear and you're both on the same page. So with spine coating in, in fusions, there comes implants. So knowing what type of implants the physician use is very important because specific implants are covered under specific uh, CPT codes. For example, interspinous fusion devices, not the distraction devices, but the fusion devices where they go in and they do a fusion uh, on a patient with the bone allograft and they use this interspinous device just to hold it open, these are still considered unlisted uh, procedures. They're not considered posterior non-segmental hardware. They're, they're still unlisted. When it comes to the inner body spacers, you wanna know what the spacer is made out of. Is the, spa is the spacer made out of peak, which is a synthetic? Is it a titanium cage? Is it made out of bone? These are the peak and the titanium cages are usually covered under 22853, whereas if it's a bone allograft spacer, it's 20931. Is it a standalone inner body cage, which you will see a picture of um, a few more slides down the road. We'll see a picture of that. But if it's a standalone cage, that means that it has integrated hardware for anchoring the device into the inner body space. It has its own plate screws, flanges, anchors, whatever they are, they're attached to the peak spacer. That's what makes it a standalone. You don't need additional hardware to anchor it because it comes with the peak spacer. So in a case like that, it's only coded as 22853 because that code includes any integrated hardware for anchoring that device in the inner body space. Is it a separate anterior plate with screws? Because in, if it is, then you've got another CPT code, 22845, to go with that. Um, is this a first-time implant? Is it a removal? Is it a revision? There are different CPT codes for each one of those scenarios, um, whether, it's, whether it's being implanted for the first time, whether it's being completely removed, or whether it's being taken out and put back in. Is it being taken out and put back in at the same space? Is it being taken out and put back in in an adjoining space? or to completely different space. Um, so these are all very important things to know because the coding is directed by what the op note is telling you. So in this procedure, posterior lumbar inner body fusion, you'll commonly hear the physicians refer to it as PLIF. What you can see here on the screen is that red circle that you're looking at is the inner body spacer and it's filled with uh, a bone, either allograft, which comes from outside the patient, or autograft, which is taken from the patient. And what you see there for hardware is what's called non-segmental. It only has two points of attachment, meaning on the right side, there's two points. On the left side, there's two points, and they're connected by rods to keep them steady. Those are called pedicle screws and rods, they actually slide the pedicle screws right into the vertebral bodies to stabilize the patient after a fusion. Because if you just put that bone in after removing the disc, the, the patient's spine can become unstable. So they usually will use pedicle screws and rods in order to stabilize the patient. We can go to the next one. So, this is an example of a lumbar inner body fusion. 
op report. So not only is the physician doing the inner body fusion, but he's also doing a posterior lateral fusion, which is putting um, bone in the posterior gutters of the spine, along the spinous process, down the sides of the outside of the spine in the back. Um, that became a combination code a few years ago. So whenever the physician does an inner body with a posterior lateral, you would use CP code, CPT code 22633. If he was just doing a posterior, it would be 22612. If he was doing just an inner body, it would be 22630. But if he does both, we now have a combination code. So in this particular instance, the patient has spondylolisthesis and radiculopathy with stenosis. The spondylolisthesis is when one vertebral body slips forward over another and it sort of throws them out of alignment. Um, so instead of being in a straight line, now you have one that's sort of forward over the other and it's putting a lot of pressure on. So what they will normally do is they will go in and they will do the laminectomy and the facetectomy in order to remove parts of the vertebral body so that they can brace it and push it back in order to put them back in line with each other. So in this particular case, this physician has done an inner body fusion. He did a decompression for the stenosis. He did a complete decompression, um, doing a complete facetectomy, um, decompressing the uh, exiting and traversing nerve roots in order to make sure that there was no additional stenosis going on after he does the inner body fusion. Once he decompresses everything, he cleans out the disc material completely and he does what's called scraping the end plates. He'll scrape the end plates of the two vertebral bodies in order to make them bleed so that when he places his peak cage filled with um, any kind of allograft or autograft in there, it will stick inside the inner body space so that it, it, it creates what's considered inner body fusion. So he's now removed the disc out of that space and he's replacing it with a spacer filled with bone in order to fuse those two vertebral bodies together. Um, so in this case, he did use a peak spacer. He's telling you that right in his note. Um, he's using BMP, which is an osteopromotive material considered an allograft. Um, and then he packs the remaining disc space around the, the spacer with mastograft, which is also an allograft. And he had harvested bone marrow, but he harvested the bone marrow locally at the site, so it's not additionally reportable. Um, then he says he decorticated the lateral gutters, which means he's kind of scraping them up in order to make them rough so that the bone that he's, he's going to pack in there will stick. So then he decorticates them. He puts all mastograft in the posterior lateral gutters. So now he has created an inner body fusion and a posterior fusion. Um, he then goes in and puts in his pedicle screws at L4 and L5, and then he inserts rods to stabilize the pedicle screws. So in this particular case, he has uh, codes for 22633 for the posterior and inner body fusion, 22840 for the posterior pedicle screws and rods because it's a one level non-segmental, 22853 because he used a peak interbody cage spacer, which is a synthetic, and then 20930 because he used allograft or osteopromotive material in order to um, help with the fusion. He packed that into the, the disc space and he packed it into the, the spacer that he put in there to aid in the fusion. So coding decompression with interbody fusion we used to be able to code for the additional 63047, 63048 when we did an inner body fusion um, because the, the codes 22630 and 22633 include partial aminectomy for preparing the inner space for fusion. The codes specifically state not for decompression. So the laminectomy included in those two codes is usually only for preparing the space for the inner body spacer that you're about to put in. According to CMS, and this comes right from the NCCI edits, they do not allow laminectomy, laminotomy, any kind of decompression at the same level as your inner body fusion. You cannot even use a modifier 59 in order to um, report the decompression because um, they consider it included in the procedure. They consider it bundled. So carriers who follow this 
and follow CCI will not allow additional decompression to be reported along with an inner body fusion. But on the next slide, there's what we call specialty societies. North American Spine Society is the orthopedic spine um, specialty society, and their take on it is, if the surgeon is removing a disc or bony end plate solely with the need to prepare the vertebrae for fusion, then no additional decompression code is reported. But it should be reported when additional to removing the disc and preparing the vertebral end plate, they remove the posterior osteophyte, osteophytes, decompress the spinal cord or nerve roots, which requires work in excess of that normally performed when doing a posterior lumbar in a body fusion. So this is where you have to know who your payers are following when you are coding your procedures. Because if your payers allow additional decompression and they follow NAS, who believes that the work in doing an, a full decompression in addition to an inner body fusion is, is significantly more work than just making the approach for the inner body spacer, then you could additionally report the decompression codes. But if your carrier follows CCI strictly, then you will not be able to report the additional decompression. So knowing, knowing your insurance carriers when it comes to procedures like this is a very important thing because you want to make sure that you're covering all of the codes that you could potentially be reporting in this case. So now we get to an anterior cervical discectomy infusion which is um, an acronym ACDF. So you may hear your physician say that he's doing an ACDF. That's what that means. So in this particular picture that you're looking at, earlier I talked about a standalone inner body spacer, which by the way is only used in anterior cases, not in posterior cases. Um, I talked about the standalone in, in inner body spacer. In this particular case, this is not a standalone inner body spacer. What they did was they used a bone spacer in the inner body, which would be 20930, and they used a separate anterior plate and screws, which would be 22845. The plate actually attaches to the front of the vertebral bodies. You'll commonly hear them say, we then attach the anterior plate once they scrape off all the osteophytes or smooth down the anterior vertebral bodies in order to place this anterior plate. That's a lot of times how you will know that he's used a separate anterior plate and that it's not part of the integral hardware for attaching the inner body spacer. On the next slide, you're gonna see a standalone spacer. This is what we call a standalone inner body device. So essentially the blue part is the plate which attaches to the gray part, which is the peak spacer that fits inside. So rather than attaching to the front of the spine, the plate, it goes in between the two vertebral bodies and is flush with the spine. And the screws go up into the upper vertebral body and down into the lower vertebral body of the fusion level. So in this particular case, with this type of standalone device, you would only code 22853 because the code includes integrated anchoring hardware, which is what this particular uh, spacer has. So for a cervical fusion, this is an anterior cervical fusion, which we see a lot of in um, an ASC situation. Um, this particular fusion is one level, C5-6. So there's one code combined for when you do the, the anterior cervical discectomy and decompression along with the inner body fusion, 22551. This was created, I believe, back in 2012. Um, we used to report this with 22554 and 63075, and they determined that they were doing this discectomy and decompression more than 75% of the time with an anterior fusion, so they created the new code to encompass both procedures together. So in this particular case, this physician is going in anteriorly, um, and I'm looking to see, he doesn't, he says he's doing an anterior cervical discectomy, which is really the only way on this note you can tell until you get into where he's saying that he made his dissection and he split the, the platysma longitudinally. That is how you know he's in the front of the spine. Normally they'll say they place the patient anterior or face up supine so that you know he's working in the front of the spine. 
So essentially he makes his approach um, and he goes in and he performs his discectomy. He's removing all of the disc material, usually down to the posterior longitudinal ligament. Um, he decompresses any um, nerve issues, any kind of uh, stenosis or any kind of compression caused by the disc. And then he removes the disc completely. He scrapes the end plates and then he places his peak cage. So he tells you it's a peak cage filled with master graft, which is an allograft into the inter body space. He said it was tamped into position. And then at this point, he took his plate and sized it and used the self tapping variable screws into the vertebral bodies of C5, C6 to secure the anterior plate. So he's telling you he used a peak spacer. He's telling you he used an anterior plate, which is separate. So in this case, you have 22551 for the anterior inner body fusion with discectomy. Placing the peak spacer is what creates that. 22845 for the separate anterior plate and screws. Now you will need a 59 on this to indicate that it is separate from the 22853 because remember 22853 now has, if it's got integrated hardware, it's included in 22853. So you want to show the carrier that it's it's completely separate. It was not part of the peak spacer. The peak spacer did not have its own integ integral hardware for anchoring. And then 20930 for the allograft used in this case to help create the fusion bone on bone. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about cervical corpectomy only because a lot of times, especially when it comes to cervical fusion cases, you will hear a lot of physicians say partial corpectomy at C5, partial corpectomy at C6 when they're doing a C5-6 inner body fusion. That's not a corpectomy. If you look on the right, the left-hand side of this picture, I'm sorry, you see that big giant space which encompasses two different levels. In a corpectomy, they remove the disc above and the disc below because they're removing the vertebral body in between. So that whole vertebral body is gone and it creates a large cavity, which means that it's more than a one level fusion when you refuse this because you've just removed the vertebral body in between. Just below that, that little opening is an anterior cervical fusion space. So what they're doing when they say partial corpectomy and they're still fusing C5-6 or C6-7, they're just scraping the end plates or removing part of the bottom of the vertebral body and the top of the body below it in order to make room for the inner body spacer. So it's important to know whether or not they really are doing a corpectomy. In order to do a corpectomy, it usually will leave a very, very large opening. So you would not be fusing C6-7, you would be fusing from C5 to C7 if you were removing the C5, the C6 vertebral body. So it, it's sort of a two level thing. It can be more, but you want to look for that because a lot of times they'll say, we did a partial corpectomy at this level and this level. I've seen that coded quite a few times and it's not actually uh, an actual corpectomy in the sense of the word. So, Allison, great. Thank you very much. We're going to uh, jump over to Tamara, who's going to discuss the spinal, spinal cord stems. Thanks a lot, Allison. We'll get back to you in just welcome. a second, okay? All right, mm -hmm. uh, Tamara? Okay, so moving on to spinal cord stimulators. For spinal cord stimulator procedures, a trial must first be performed. Typically, we see either a one or two lead trial. Um, in order to move on to the permanent placement of a system, you must have a successful trial. Uh, many times payers will have different requirements, what, what your results are of that trial um, in order to deem that trial successful and then to move on to the permanent placement. In this particular op note, it's an example of a permanent spinal cord stimulator. You will notice that the patient, or go ahead and do the watching. next slide. You'll notice that the physician first starts off placing the two percutaneous leads. Um, the first one is, is performed and uh, advances the octrode lead through the TUI needle up to the mid portion of the T7. And then the physician 
notes that they repeated this on the right side with a second lead and again advanced the lead without complication on the right side up to the mid portion of T7. So right now he, the physician has placed both percutaneous leads. Then in addition to the lead placement, they're going to tunnel the leads to the pocket that has been created for the placement of the generator. So in the next paragraph, the third paragraph on this slide, you'll, you'll see that the physician makes an incision into the right flank. And normally we'll see a flank incision or a buttock incision in order to place the generator. And then, like I said, they tunnel the leads to the pocket and then they will connect the leads to the generator device. Um, so in this particular situation, you would code 63685 for the placement of the generator, and then 63650, two line items. And then depending on your carrier requirement, the second CPT code 63650 will either have a modifier 76 or a modifier 59 appended. So an, another uh, pain management procedure that we see all the time performed in the ASC are radiofrequency ablations, whether they be cervical, lumbar, thoracic. Um, in this particular op note, the physician is performing a two-level lumbar facet joint ablation. Um, and this is just an example of a well-documented note. In an, ideal note, we wish that they would document both the facet joints as well as the nerves that are being treated. Um, back in 2012, as, as you know, the codes not only changed for radiofrequency ablation, but they also changed from being able to report per nerve to facet joint level. Um, it's amazing how many doctors I still talk to regularly that aren't aware of the fact that you can't bill per nerve, that it has to be per facet joint level. Um, so in this document, next page, please. Go back one. Go back one. Yeah. Go ahead and just talk to So that. anyway, in this, in the first paragraph here, you'll notice that the doc, doctor actually uh, documents where he's placing the ablation needles, talking about the junction of the superior aspect of the right L4, the transverse process, and the lateral aspect of the right L4 superior articular process. Um, what I like about this note is he not only notes where he's placing the needle at the transverse process and superior articular process, but he also talks about walking the needle over the transverse process to lie along the course of the right L3 medial branch nerve. Um, and then he goes on to state that he's doing a radio frequency ablation using 80 degrees for 90 seconds. You know, guidelines from the payer state that the temperature and the time frame needs to be documented in the op note. And that just goes along with the guidelines that were uh, presented by the AMA in 2016, I believe it was, where they added the guideline for radio frequency of the facet joints, CPT code 64633 through 64636, that if they are performing the radio frequency ablation at less than 80 degrees Celsius, it defaults to an unlisted 64999. And then likewise, if they're doing a pulsed radio frequency ablation, um, it's going to be unlisted 64999. So it's very important that you have all of these pieces of documentation in the op note. Right, no one likes the unlisted codes. No, no they don't. Um, so for this particular note, we would report 64635 bilateral and 64636 bilateral since it was two levels. And then we're going to jump. Uh, Allison, you want to talk about one more spine or two more spine issues uh, quickly? I think we only have a couple minutes left. Certainly. Uh, I, I just wanted to touch on these really, really quickly because we're starting to see these a lot of these up and coming. Um, interspinous distraction devices, which were created to um, prop open the vertebral bodies 
to open up the canal for stenosis um, used to be reported under O171T. Last year, they came out with uh, two new sets of codes. We can move to the next slide. Two new sets of codes. The first new set of codes would be for uh, interspinous distraction device when the physician performs an open decompression prior to inserting the device. In other words, he's going in and he's doing the work of 63047. He's doing the laminectomy, he's doing the facetectomy, he's doing the foramenotomy, he's decompressing the nerve roots for stenosis, and then he's inserting this device to hold the, the area open to keep it from um, getting all compressed again. So 22 867 is the first level, and 22868 would be if he did an additional level with open decompression. We can go to the next slide. So these are some examples of the, the interspinous distraction device with open decompression. So first, they're doing the open decompression, and you see this little U-shaped device in the last picture on the bottom right. That little U-shaped device will actually hold the spine open so that the, the patient's stenosis does not return in theory. That's what these were, were created for, to, to keep it open. So the next set of codes on the next page would be 22869 and 22870. Now this is when you insert an interspinous distraction device with no open decompression. So these are made to create indirect decompression. So what they're saying with these are, you put these in very similarly um, in between the, the spinous process, you put these in without doing any kind of decompression procedure before putting them in, and this is supposed to open up the vertebral bodies enough to perform indirect decompression, meaning it will open up the space enough for the nerves to move around without you having to remove any of the bone to, to do a direct decompression. And the next page will show you sort of um, examples of those where they have not cut away any of the bone. As you can see, the, the device is a little bit different. It's sort of like a little clip in between instead of a U-shaped device to hold it open because the U-shaped device actually holds up the spinous process. This will hold it up, but not because they've removed any of the bone in front of it or around it. Um, this just holds it open, creating an indirect decompression. So now instead of 0171T, we actually have two sets of codes, one with direct decompression and one without direct decompression to report these spinous process devices. And uh, uh, Scott, we're going to uh, uh, stop there, clearly uh, uh, coding and knowing payer guidelines uh, to avoid medical necessity denials uh, is key in the information that we just passed on, and um, uh, we could go uh, on and on and on for probably another couple of hours with examples of, of uh, how this doesn't work, so we'll turn it over to you for questions now, if that's okay. No, thank you so much, Lisa, Allison, and Tamara. Um, I know just a depth of in-depth knowledge on spine coding and, and surgery coding, so thank you. We've got a number of questions, and Lisa and team, you will understand these questions better than I do, so don't um, so jump in if I'm botching the question, okay? Um, if, if a surgeon's using an interlaminar approach for lumbar discectomy and still directly visualizing, but with an endoscope as opposed to a microscope, is, should the operative port be similar? Should it be the same operative report? Lisa, did you get that question? Yes, and Allison, that's all for you. Yeah, I, I got that question. If he's viewing, if he's using an endoscope, um, it, it, it's not technically considered direct visualization. Um, there is an endoscopic discectomy code now, 62380. Um, the report is is sort of similar to a, a more minimally invasive approach. They're doing it through a tubular retractor and they're using an endoscope for visualization versus opening the patient up and visualizing with their naked eye or with the operating microscope. Thank you. And anytime you give an answer, feel free to then sum up the answer too for our audience just so they as clear as possible, but that's great and helpful. Thank you. CPT code 22853 for interior fusion. What if the physician boards a laminectomy just for decompression at the same spinal level? 
how does that tie to CPT code 22853? I'm sorry, say that again. A laminectomy so the, at the same? Yes. If, if the physician performs a laminectomy just for decompression mm -hmm. um, at, at the same spinal level. If we're, if we're talking about posterior, then we're talking about whether or not the payer follows CCI edits because 22853 is an inner body. It creates inner body fusion. That's placing the inner body spacer. So... If, if the payer follows CCI edits, then you won't be able to additionally report the decompression at the same level as the placing the inner body spacer and creating the inner body fusion because it does include um, partial laminectomy in order to place the spacer. Gotcha, thank you. So here's the next question. When would you code 22853 alone versus code 22853 plus CPT code 22845. What's the difference in when you'd be able to use CPT 22845 as well? Okay, so 22853, um, when they created those codes, they created them with the intention of these new standalone inner body spacers that I talked about earlier that have their own integrated hardware for anchoring them into the spine. So if you're using a standalone, you're only going to code 22853 because it has its own integrated hardware for anchoring. But if you're using a peak spacer or a bone spacer or a cage that does not have integrated hardware for anchoring and you have to put an additional anterior plate and screws into the front of the vertebral spine, that's when you would additionally use 22845 with the 22853 in order to to uh, report the inner body spacer as well as the anterior plating that you just did. Thank you. And, and maybe this is a similar question. When would you code a corpectomy with an anterior cervical fusion? The only time that you would code a corpectomy in addition to an anterior cervical fusion is when you're actually removing over a third of the cervical vertebral body. You you're not coding a corpectomy if they say that it's a partial corpectomy and that they're just kind of scraping the end plates of the level above and the level below. A corpectomy is actually removing one vertebral body right in the middle. So you would hear that they did a discectomy at one level and a discectomy at another and remove the body in between. That's the only time you're really gonna code a corpectomy with a cervical fusion is when they actually remove over a third of the vertebral body. Got it. So the next question is, what CPT codes would you assign for an RFA procedure performed at L3, comma, L4, comma, L5? Allison, I'll take that one. First of all, what I would do is I would clarify with the physician whether the L3, L4, L5 is documenting the facet joint levels or the medial branch nerves. Um, so many times we see documentation in pain management procedures that are using the term level and nerve interchangeably. But since we do RFAs per facet joint level and not the nerve, we would clarify. So if they clarified that the L3, L4, L5 were the medial branch nerves, then we would code that as a two level RFA. Got it, thank you. A couple other questions. The removal of the trial lead be reported with CPT 63661, and, and how does 63661 work? Okay, so CPT code 63661, which is removal of leads, per the CPT guidelines, and this is right out of the CPT book, um, you cannot you cannot report removal of trial leads with 63661. The removal of the trial leads is inherent to the placement of the trial leads. So you cannot, you can only report 63661 when you're removing a permanent uh, lead from the patient. And that, and that is not a payer policy? No, that is a CPT guideline for that code. That's, that's compliant coding, yes. Got it. So when would you assign CPT code 22849 for spinal hardware? When is that used? So I'll take this one, Tamara. So 22849 is a revision of spinal hardware. 
That code is used if you are taking out spinal hardware and replacing it at the exact same level that you took it out of. Essentially, it's sometimes you have to take it out because a screw got loose or you're taking it out to revise a fusion and you're putting it back in at the exact same level. Then you would use 22849. And Lisa, let me ask you a question. How does that practice or center or hospital keep track of all these different CPT codes for spinal work or pain management work? It's, yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, that's really the question. I'm, I'm sort of curious. How do they keep track of this stuff so that they're constantly updated and accurate? Or is this why there's been so much outsourcing in sort of spine coding and spine billing? What's the what's your take on that? I mean, I, I mean, you know, in recent years, we've seen a lot of migration from the hospital to the surgery center environment. Um, so uh, it's it's fairly new to to our space. And it's really hard to do. So you have to, um, as Allison stated, you really have to have someone that can have a conversation with the surgeon, understanding uh, all of the different players in building that, that code combination for the case. Uh, and the players, meaning um, uh, CPT, uh, your specialty associations like NAS, um, CCI edits, whether it's applicable, other payer policies, all of that has to go into the decision making with the surgeons and uh, the, the leaders of the organization to come up with the proper coding. And then you have to have it audited, really, because this is it's very difficult to do. Um, I, and, and, uh, and you have to make sure that you retain an auditor that understands spine coding in an ASC environment. Um, so I think that's that's the only way to keep track of it. It's very difficult. And, and, and then if you're um, a practice or a spine center or a surgery center doing a lot of spine, you've got to have a couple people that really know this stuff because you could never afford to have just one of anybody because if that person gets sick or quits or leaves, you now get all these backed up claims that have to be done correctly and you don't have the internal talent to do it. And that's one of the things that's also led to some of the outsourcing as things get more complex to really build in-house talent for, although a lot of people are doing it in-house. One more question here. Can you clarify the difference uh, in Lisa Elser and Samara, who was the right person there, in the spinal cord stimulator codes based on the frequency of the generator? Um, I, in essence, C1820 versus C1822, the difference in those in those codes. Okay, so the C1822 was actually created uh, back, I believe, in 2016 when Nevro came out with their high frequency generator. So what happened was they went and had the C1822 code developed, where typically for spine stems for Medicare, it's device dependent, which means we don't report the supply codes in addition to the CPT codes for the placement of the system. But for the C1822, that was created for us to bill to Medicare for the Nevro generator. So that the pass-through has expired. It expired the end of 2017. So that's what the C1822 uh, represented. But typically in the... But typically in the ASC, we use the L868 uh, family of codes for the generators. Um, Scott, I, I wanted to add one more thing to your last question. Sorry, I wanted to just interject real quick that um, we, we see an awful lot of, uh, of upcoding in this, in this uh, arena, uh, which is why it's our privilege to share our experience with, with your audience. And so having that outside uh, auditing company check your work is, uh, is critical to protecting uh, the, the reimbursements that you're getting because uh, you can't use I've been paid for it. Uh, that's also, if it's upcoded and it's audited, a liability. Yeah, got it. So even if somebody is an outsource, you would highly recommend auditing periodically. Once a year, every couple of years, how often do people audit to make sure that they don't have a looming disaster or problem. Yeah, it's a really good question. If your if your coding uh, personnel changes, 
uh, I would audit them a good, you know, six months after that's occurred. And then, and then a good policy is every other year, but it really depends on uh, uh, how much the, the coding has changed in the last year. Uh, a lot of large organizations have a compliance policy that is an annual outside review. Uh, but if your coding hasn't changed and the, and, the, and the codes themselves haven't changed much, every other year is okay, but once a year is good. But outside auditing is critical for, for these high paying cases. Got it. I, I want to thank Lisa, Allison, Tamara, and really, and, and really the National Medical NMBS team. The, the, one of the things I love about Lisa and her team is they you get exactly what you expect, complete trustworthy and high integrity, which anybody you're working with, conscientious. Just say, do what they're supposed to do, good, good people. I appreciate you guys sponsoring. One of the things I really appreciate about sponsoring an event like this is the tremendous effort to really give great information to our listeners and not be doing a sales pitch. Just a fantastic, deep information. I hope very helpful the practices and centers and administrators on the phone uh, and, the, and, the, and the coding and billing professionals, but really helpful. And I just, as a, you know, I've known the NM, um, BS team, and Lisa, uh, for more than probably 15 years now, um, and just cannot say enough great things about the professionalism and integrity that they bring to what they do. So Lisa and your whole team, uh, Allison and Tamara presenting today, I, I want to thank you for doing this today, and I hope our, our audience enjoyed it, and I just cannot tell you much how much I appreciate the professionalism of the approach in, in providing this kind of webinar. So thank you so much. Uh, people should know how to reach Lisa and team if you'd like to follow up with them for just general information or for audits or to hire them. Lisa, I assume all the information is on your slide, but did you want to share it with the audience very quickly? Sure. It's on the last slide, info at nationalasbbilling.com. Fantastic. And as always, Lisa, we appreciate your entire team's efforts and thoughtfulness and just so professional and so great. So thank you so much. And we'll we'll uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, folks.